Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. My name is Jim McDonald, and I am serving in the interim capacity here in the United Parish of Bowie. While the pastor, Chris Deacon, is on a three-month sabbatical, Chris will return October 24th. We welcome all who have joined us today for worship. We especially want to welcome those who are here for the first time or those who are coming back after a time of way. We hope you find this service inspiring and comforting and experience the warmth and the caring of this congregation. And that you'll return again and again. And we also want to acknowledge and welcome those who have joined us today online via our live streaming and YouTube channel. I have several announcements. The next trivia night is September 8th, a week from this Wednesday. It's been changed, the date. So September 8th, you can join via a Zoom link. If you're not yet receiving the link, but would like to join in the fun, please see me or text me after worship. Next Sunday, September 5th, we will have a guest preacher, Laquan Turner, no stranger to this congregation. So please join us next week to welcome Laquan Turner to the pulpit um, and to hear an inspiring sermon. And also on September 12th, two weeks hence, we will be celebrating communion. So we also want to invite you to be here and to join us for that service as well. Okay, friends, let's breathe deep, calm our minds, center our hearts. With diverse friends near and far, strange and familiar, Let's lean into the beauty of worship. Let's raise our voices together in prayer and song. Let's support each other, share Christ's peace with each other, love one another as we journey together through this life in faith together. Let us stand and join in the call to worship that you'll find printed on the screen. God is love. And for those who abide in love, abide in God, and God in him. Come, let us sing for the joy of the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the heart of our salvation. Let us come before the Lord with thanksgiving, and praise God with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great Lord. In God's hands are the depths of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to God. The sea is God's, for God made it, and God's hands belong to God. Come, let us bow down in worship, let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For the Lord is our God, and we are the people of God's pasture, the flock under God's care.
please join me in the opening prayer. Great Trinity of God, love, from the profound communion of your divine life, pour out upon us a torrent of familiar love. Grant us the love reflected in the actions of Jesus, in his family of Nazareth, and in the early Christian community. Come, Holy Spirit, show us your beauty reflected in all the peoples of the earth, so that we may discover anew that all are important and all are necessary. Different faces of the one humanity that God so loves. Amen. You may be seated. The psalmist reminds us the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Our God will not always chide, nor will God keep God's anger forever. As far as the east is from the west, so far does God remove our transgressions from us. Knowing the grace and mercy of our God, let us be bold and confess our sins together. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you a thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, Forgive what we have been, help us remain what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of the Holy Name. Amen. Who is in a position to condemn? Only Christ. And Christ died for us. Christ rose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Anyone in Christ is a new creation. The old has passed away. All things are new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel in Jesus Christ. We are forgiven. So I'm going to take a picture here. This is the COVID. <laughs> the COVID picture. Make sure we all know who's here in case something happens, but we trust that it won't, but this is our insurance. Join me in prayer, please. Open our hearts, O oh God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture reading is taken from the Song of Solomon, chapter 2. The voice of my beloved, look, he comes leaping upon the mountains, bounding over the hills. My beloved is like a gazelle or a young stag. Look, there he stands behind our wall, gazing in at the windows, looking through the lattice. My beloved speaks and says to me, arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. For now the winter is past, 
the rain is gone and over, the flowers appear on the earth, the time of singing has come, and the voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth its figs, and the vines are in blossom. They give forth fragrance. Arise, my love, my fair one, and come away. This is the word of the Lord. Our second scripture reading is taken from the Gospel of John in the 15th chapter. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you will love one another. We celebrate the written word of scripture. Thanks be to God. We celebrate the living word, Christ among us. Thanks be to God. The passage we heard from the Song of Solomon is a celebration of human desire and the attraction that two people can feel for each other. It is wonderfully sensual. Like the old popular song says, love is a many splendor thing. A million songs have been written about love, a million poems, and if we believe them, love is something we fall in and out of. It's a feeling, a balm, an intoxicant. Love captures us. It takes us by surprise. It's something we wish for, we long for, and take to life when it comes. Love simply happens without any effort on our part. It's in the category with good sleep, good dreams, the taste of raspberries, and the smell of rain. It's a gift from above. Being in love is a wonderful thing. It makes us feel fully alive. Even the Bible celebrates this, that sense of what it means to be in love. So, the question must be asked, why does the Bible also command us to love? How can a feeling be produced on demand? Why would the Bible reduce something so wonderful uh, to a duty? or an obligation? And why does the Apostle Paul tell us to be, let our love be genuine? Can love ever be fake? Well, of course we want love to be a many splendor thing, but the problem is love isn't always like that. Love can be a pretty confusing thing as well, and a pretty challenging thing. As much as we might want it to be, the fact is we don't go through life always and everywhere feeling like we're in love. Those feelings of love are not always present in us when we expect them to be, when we feel they should be, or even when we need them to be. Newlyweds 
have a reservoir of good feelings that have been built up over months as their relationship has grown, and they begin to weave their lives together. And it's wonderful to see how much in love two people can be as we observe them at the altar. But there's not a person here today who expects that those feelings are going to remain high and wonderful in a sustained way for the rest of their lives, their newlywed lives. The demands and responsibilities of life, the day-to-day -day adjustments of life together will intrude. They're going to go through valleys and rough places where either life around them changes in unsettling ways, or they themselves change in unpredictable and surprising ways. And there will be doubts and tears and hurt and anger. And that reservoir of good feelings, so much in evidence when they recited their vows to one another, will become depleted. And at some point the question will occur, is my love genuine or am I faking it? We're all familiar with a situation where we have found ourselves attracted to a man or a woman who, at a distance, seems to be the answer to our dreams and longings, hopes and fantasies. But then, you know, on closer examination, he or she turns out to be, well, rather ordinary, but kind of human, kind of annoying. <laughs> to paraphrase what Judith Yorst, one of my favorite authors, once wrote about the difference between love and infatuation. Infatuation is when you think he's as gorgeous as Denzel Washington, as pure as Mahatma Gandhi, as funny as Chris Rock, as athletic as Dennis Rodman, and as smart as Albert Einstein. Love is when you realize he's as gorgeous as Chris Rock, as smart as Dennis Rodman, as funny as Mahatma Gandhi, as athletic as Albert Einstein, and nothing like Denzel Washington in any category. <laughs> but we'll take him anyway. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Maybe love is something that needs to be commanded. Charlotte and Howard Kleinbell, a well-known couple who have been writing about pastoral care, for many years. They wrote a classic book called The Intimate Marriage. And in it they describe how two people can live in the same house for decades without ever being present for each other, without ever experiencing a joining or a linking of thoughts and feelings, longings, fears, dreams, and delights. I feel like you're a thousand miles away, protests the wife. And she was speaking to her husband, who was sitting at the other end of the table. It's what happens when people, too often in many marriages, and maybe that's why love is something that has to be commanded. If love is primarily a matter of feelings, then we're all in trouble. Because we don't always act in ways that make others want to love us. Let me repeat that. If love is primarily a matter of feelings, then we're all in trouble because we don't always act in ways that will make others want to love us. I give you this command, said Jesus, that you love one another as I have loved you. These words express what is surely the heart of the gospel. Surely. Love one another. But again, why is it something that has to be commanded? I think Jesus understands full well the difficulty that we humans have of relating to each other. He understands our very human compulsion to keep our distance, to withdraw, to retreat or to strike out against those who disturb us or who bruise or damage our egos. Jesus understands how risky it feels to give ourselves, to open ourselves to another, warts and all. Jesus knows how scary it feels 
to have to become vulnerable and to admit that we might be wrong, that we have made a mistake, and that we are not as confident of ourselves as we want everyone else to believe. I think Jesus understands. Jesus loves us. Jesus also understands something else as well, that not to love psychically, spiritually, is to die. As Friedrich, Frederick Buechner once said, to live for yourself alone, hoarding your life for your own sake, is in almost every sense that matters to reduce your life to a life hardly worth the living and thus to lose it. When Jesus says that whoever would save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will save it, surely he is not making a statement about how morally speaking life ought to be. Rather, Jesus is making a statement about how life is. And when John writes that the person who does not love remains in death, he is not pronouncing an ethical judgment but an important insight into what it means to be human. And that's why Jesus commands us to love. Because he knows how much love has to offer, not only to us, but to those who receive it from us. He also commands us to love because he knows as well that what love has to offer does not come easily to us, but rather is something that we need to continually work at. In the Christian sense, then, love is not primarily an emotion, but an act of the will. It is a deeply religious act. For at some point in the course of all our relations that life gives us, we have to believe that love is always a possibility. To believe this and to act on this belief is the very essence of our faith in the God of grace. Morton Kelsey, an Episcopal priest and at one time a professor of Christian spirituality at San Francisco Theological Seminary, relates his own humbling personal experience in loving. He writes, my second son had not yet learned to read during fifth grade. After considering all the possibilities, we finally settled on a remedial school. The first thing they did was to administer a battery of psychological tests on him. And then Kelsey, the psychologist, found himself at the other end of the table with the, the, the uh, counselor asking him, do you have any idea what this child's problem is? Stubbornness, Kelsey replied. And then the counselor dropped the bombshell the problem with this child is that he doesn't think you really care for him or that you really love him. Kelsey protested vigorously that whenever he tried to show his, love, his son love and warmth and affection, his son had pushed him away. The psychologist continued, has it ever occurred to you why he pushes you away? He's testing you to see how much you really do love him. At 11 years of age, Kelsey said, at 11. Kelsey decided on the spot that he was going to love his son if it was the last thing Kelsey ever did. The real turnaround came one day in a motel on an ocean front. Kelsey came to his son's room one morning and asked, Johnny, would you like to go swimming with me? And then as only an 11-year-old can do, his son replied, nah, I'd rather watch TV. In the past, when Kelsey had gotten this kind of response, he would leave, feeling rejected, to spend time doing something he would have preferred to do anyway. But this time he thought to himself, perhaps my son is only testing me. I'll keep my sense of humor and pursue him. And in a very playful manner, Kelsey capered over to the TV set, turned it off, and the two of them tussled around the room, out the door, down the steps, and into the ocean. 
When his son emerged from the first wave, he blew the water from his nose and exclaimed, Dad, I wondered how long it would take you to do this. That's why Jesus commands us to love. And the Apostle Paul encourages us to make our love genuine. Love is complicated. complicated. It's not always easy. It requires us to be genuine, authentic, to reach down deep and to remember God's love for us. And then to choose to be the person that God created us to be. Genuine love seeks the welfare and well-being of the other, the other person. It affirms the worth and dignity of the other person. It's steadfast and unconditional. Genuine love never gives up on the other person. It finds a way to stay connected. It takes risks for the sake of renewing, keeping, and strengthening a relationship. Genuine love may say hard things for the other person to hear. It may take actions that the other person isn't ready to accept. But genuine love all, almost always makes the first move toward reconciliation. It's the first to admit fault and to ask forgiveness. Fake love is motivated by a calculation that there's more in this for me than for you. Genuine love doesn't calculate its return on investment. Fake love are the actions and the behaviors that are principally motivated by our own needs rather than the needs of the other. But genuine love is about breaking the grip of self-absorption. So friends, let us remember and take heart to what Jesus told us and his disciples. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. May it be so for you and for me. The Board of United Parish of Bowie has authorized a special mission offering for Haiti. So if you write a check to UPB today or in the next couple of weeks and you simply indicate on the check that this is for Haiti in the little note part, everything that is so designated will go to the United Church of Christ's Emergency Relief Fund. But your gifts can also support the ongoing ministries of the United Parish of Bowie if you do not designate it for Haiti. So please give generously. All that we are and all that we have is a gift from God. We give not, of, not out of compulsion or guilt, but out of gratitude. For all that God has bestowed upon us freely and without merit. Let us join together in singing and stand, please.
Please be seated. So we're going to move into a time of prayer. Some of you have already indicated uh, a couple of things um, that I want to mention now, but if you have want to also text me, there's a number. You can send me a text and we'll uh, join them together in our prayers in just a few minutes. But I first want to tell you that Tom Chin told us this week that Rick Schroeder uh, had died of COVID in Gainesville, Florida. And so we want to lift him up and his family. Uh, this very tragic moment. And Sue Kennedy uh, was also talking about the Brookdale, the assisted living facility where her friend Carol lives, uh, has shut down again, including the dining room. And residents now have to eat their meals in their rooms because a resident has tested positive. So all inside group activities and visits have been canceled, and it's not just about the outside visits. I'm not sure about that, actually. We're, we're not sure, though it's really very hot. It was just about two months ago that Carol was able to finally leave and go out on outings, not just doctor's appointments. So it's really frustrating since she does not understand really what's happening. And I'm sure she's not alone in that confusion. There's a joy, actually, Irene uh, at Riderwood, resident Doris Burlingame, who had to go into quarantine because her hairdresser tested positive has actually now been, the quarantine's been lifted and so she's able to engage people and be among her friends and that's important to her. So what I'd like to do is to move into a time of prayer and to allow you to uh, offer prayers out loud and you can just uh, say the name of a person or a place. It doesn't have to be eloquent. It has to come from where you are. Whatever joy or concern or thanksgiving that you have, now's the time to lift them up and we'll honor that prayer by making it our own. We'll say, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So I'll start us off. I'll invite you to say whatever you'd like to say. We'll make it our part of our prayer. We'll close with the Lord's prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, loving God, our hearts are open to you. They are full, they are empty, they are longing to be in relationship with you and with others. We bring before you the concerns of our lives, the joys of our lives of our world. We do this in faith, knowing that your Holy Spirit prays in us and through us and for us. And you've taught us to lift up our very selves in prayer to you and that you hear our prayers and you join our prayers with your prayers for us. And so on this day, we, we lift up the people of Afghanistan, the grieving families of U.S. soldiers, but also of civilians there for all the destruction, violence, the loss of life, the confusion, the, the panic. Oh God, we, we have 
very little that we can do, but we want to you to to lift to you those concerns of ours in the hope that our prayers will be joined with others to bring peace and comfort and a way forward to understand your presence in the midst of all of this suffering. Likewise, we lift up the people of Haiti struggling, struggling to somehow put their lives back together after a, a terrible, terrible earthquake. And a hurricane on top of that or a tropical storm that just continued to wreak havoc. People without resources, people who are so poor, who don't know where their next meal is coming from, who need medical assistance, need the loving care of others, need to find hope in the midst of this devastation. Here are our prayers for the people of Haiti and for those who are trying to assist them in whatever way possible. We give you thanks for all those who are in places around the world, including here in our own country, in our own county, in our own city, who are working to help alleviate the suffering of others, who work in hospitals and emergency rooms, who do the simple chores every day that make our lives easier and better. God, we are grateful. Help us to be express that gratefulness, to find ways to thank them in person. We lift up the residents of Brookdale and Carol in their confusion and distress. We ask that this COVID pandemic end, O oh God. We are bold to ask it to go away, to leave us be, to let us return to health as individuals, but also as a society. Help us to find ways to honor one another, to protect ourselves, but also to reach out when we can to offer a helping hand or a word, a telephone call, a text. Oh God, now we lift up the various prayers of our hearts. Hear us as we call upon your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And my prayers for my daughter, Lisa, who's going in for arthroscopic surgery on her knee. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers.
people facing Hurricane Ida. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Our son Ryan and his family driving back from Michigan today. They started school ball, so they've been away for a long time. Proudly, mercy. Lord, in your mercy, Oh God, you know each one of us. You know what we carry, the burdens and the joys, gratitude. We lift those prayers to you in faith that your spirit is indeed praying in us and for us and through us. And we join those prayers in the one that you have taught us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with us all and remain with us now and forever. Amen. Amen.